Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and our hearts are filled with gratitude over all that you have done. Uh, Father, you have called us out of darkness and into light. Uh, Lord, you have taken a people who were far from you, a people, uh, Lord, who did not know you, and you have made them your own. Uh, Father, you have reconciled us to yourself through the blood of your Son. And so, Father, we gather here together as the saints of God, the children of God, those who have been born again to a living hope. And, Father, we pray this morning that as we turn our attention, turn our hearts uh, to your word, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. Uh, Father, impress upon our hearts the truths of the Scripture, not just for our information, but for our transformation. Lord, bring conviction of sin where it is needed. And Father, I pray you would bring comfort where it is needed. Give us hope, uh, Lord, the hope of eternal life, the blessed hope of our Savior. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for each and every person that you have brought here this morning. I pray for those, Lord, that might be here who uh, have, have not heard the good news of the gospel. Uh, Lord, or perhaps have heard it but, but never considered it. Lord, I pray that this morning uh, your spirit would open their hearts. Open their eyes, Father, to see the goodness that they might taste and see uh, that you are indeed good. And Father, that they might experience the, the gift of the new birth. And Father, that you would be glorified and that uh, your name would be exalted. So Father, move me aside this morning, I pray. Speak to us through your word for your glory and your glory alone, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Turn with me this morning to the second chapter of Paul's letter to Titus, Titus chapter 2. If you're not familiar with the the Bible, that's not a problem, just go to the back in the book of Revelation and start turning forward and you'll eventually come across Titus. It's a very short letter. Uh, There are three chapters and uh, in my Bible it, it is basically two pages long, so I uh, hope you are able to find that. Chapters are the large numbers on the page, the verses are the small numbers, and they will be here to help us as we navigate through the text this morning. And I just want you to follow along with me as we read the first ten verses here in chapter two. <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, and to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a good model of good works, or a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior." This is the word of the Lord. In 1948, American philosopher and University of Chicago professor Richard Weaver penned a book that has kind of become a bit of a classic. Uh, The book was entitled, Ideas Have Consequences. In his book, Weaver warned that the decline of Western civilization, and again, remember this is 1948, it's about 76 years ago, he was seeing this. And he warned that the decline of Western civilization was being hastened by the embrace of bad ideas, most significantly a belief in moral relativism and the denial of absolute truth. Weaver pointed to the growing failure in Western man's, the Western man's ability to think rationally. He also pointed to the utter incoherence of modern art and also a rise in moral decadence as the most glaring consequences of these bad ideas. These ideas, he said, were being spoon-fed to a populace 
at large through a broken education system, as well as a corrupt and manipulative media, which he referred to as the great stereopticon. He warned that the ideas of those who were in control of these systems would be the ultimate determiners not only of what people think, but of how they lived. In other words, the entire Western world was going to be changed. It would look completely different based on the ideas that were funneled through these two primary means of communication, that being the education system and secondly, the media itself, which at that time was predominantly newspapers and some televisions. As we come to chapter 2 of Paul's letter here to Titus this morning, we find that Weaver's assertion that ideas have consequences is nothing new. In fact, though he never self-identified as a Christian, Weaver was clearly heavily and, and significantly influenced by a Christian worldview. The Apostle Paul knew better than anyone the correlation between what a person believes and how they live. The picture that we find of Paul in the book of Acts is that of a a pioneering church planter, and, and he was certainly that. However, when you read Paul's letters, his epistles, another picture emerges. From Paul's letters, we learn that a significant portion of his ministry was visiting and writing to churches that he had planted, and his primary concern for these churches was their conduct, which flowed from teaching. That's why in every one of his letters, nearly every one of his letters, there is an exhortation or admonition concerning false teachers. There is always a call to the church to be on guard against false teaching, and there's an, there are also admonitions of the church to the church to get rid of false teachers who were present within the midst of the body. Why? Why such an emphasis on false teachers? Because Paul understood that nothing is more consequential in the life of the church, in the life of its families and its individual members, than the ideas that are taught there. Ideas do indeed have consequences. What you believe will flesh itself out in the way that you live. Everything that you do, every decision that you make, is rooted in your belief system. Something that you believe to be true or untrue about yourself, about God, and about others. Hence, false teaching was a blight in the church. We see a warning here in chapter 1 of Titus. It's it's the, the negative side of this warning, we might say. When Paul warns Titus there in verse 10, he says, "...for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party." So what is Titus to do? He says, they must be silenced. Why? Since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and this testimony is true. Therefore, again, he says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. The false teachers who had crept into the church, he says, were upsetting entire families. Entire families were thrown into disarray by this teaching. By the doctrines, by the ideas that were were finding their way through the congregation. And this was leading to all sorts of of immoral behavior within the congregation. A lot of self-centeredness and selfishness. So the first order of business, Paul says to Titus, is to silence them and rebuke them. Stop them from promoting their ideas. It's it's causing harm in the church. However, silencing and rebuking false teachers was not all that Titus was to do. While the ministry of church leaders is certainly corrective in nature, the majority of the work of church leaders is often given to formative, right? So you have formative and corrective. So if you're a parent, you understand this. And if you're a good parent, you have this somewhat down, right? Now, when children are little, there's a lot of corrective. No, 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 right? As they get older, you're hopefully teaching them and instilling in them truth. And so formative formative discipline, as we might call it, or formative teaching, is simply teaching the truth. What is right? What is good? What God has said? 
corrective is, is coming alongside and when someone steps out of that teaching, when someone violates that teaching, when someone disobeys the Word of God and, and, and calling them to come back into line with it. So you have formative and you have corrective. If you're a good parent, you spend the bulk of your time doing the formative. And if you're doing the formative well, then the corrective will not be quite as necessary or at least not as necessary as often. And so Paul is not just simply saying here, you know, get rid of the false teachers, eliminate them, but rather he has a, that, that's the negative side of this, but there's also a positive side of this. Church leaders uh, are, are not merely to be known for what they're against, right? They should also be known for what they are for. It is not enough to point out that which is sinful and ugly, but we must also uphold that which is, is uh, holy and beautiful. That's the qualification for elder, right? One of them is he must be a lover of of good, a lover of all that is good. I fear that this is one reason the church at large today is losing its influence in the wider culture. You know, we have become very good at pointing out all that is wrong in the world. In fact, that's what politics kind of calls us to do, right? I mean, no politician is going to be elected by saying, look how great the incumbent is doing. Right? You know, you've always got to find fault with the guy before you. And, and so the tendency of politics is always to point out the wrong, and, and we have to be careful not to fall into that. We can, woe is me, look at the world, look at the state of the world and all that is, rather than holding up something that is good, true, and beautiful for the world to see. As, as uh, it was said, I can't remember who said it, I, 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 it's a quote that I've kept in my files over the years, and it says that the early church didn't, the early church did not say, look what the world is coming to. Instead, the early church said, look what has come into the world. And that's the difference between a Christian worldview and a non-Christian worldview. A fatalistic worldview and a worldview of hope, of blessed hope. Parents, let me, let me encourage you in this briefly here because this is so important. We're living at a time where as parents, we find ourselves having to point out a lot of uh, things to our children that are not right. It's in the world, it's in the culture, it's in the media, it's everywhere. And, and so we can spend a great deal of our time showing our children all the things that are wrong, all the things they should avoid, all the things that are bad, all the places where God has said no. But if that's all you're ever giving to your children, you're only giving them half the picture. You need to show them where God has said yes. Instead of constantly pointing out all of the, the problems in our world with gender and sexuality, which are rampant today, you need to be modeling for them and teaching them about God's good design and the beauty of it. The greatest tool you have for your children in your home to ensure that they remain faithful and true to God and His Word is your marriage. Your marriage does more to communicate the realities of the gospel to your children than probably anything you will ever say to them Anything you will ever do in front of them. Show them what is good and beautiful. Don't simply focus on where God has said no. Show them the beauty of where God has said yes. And the same is true in the church. We don't want to be a church that only focuses, is, focuses on where God has said no. We must also show them where He has said yes. So in addition to ridding the church of false teachers, we see here that Paul instructs Titus to ensure that the church is taught that which is true. Verse 1, notice, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. The teaching of sound doctrine is essential in the life of the church because sound doctrine is what ultimately, by, empowered by the Spirit, is ultimately what produces godly living. Paul contrasts Titus here with the false teachers. Notice he begins, he says, but as for you, in other words, Titus... This is what they are doing, but this is what you are to do. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. And Now, another interesting point here. This phrase, sound doctrine, is significant. We don't want to just gloss over that. What is, what is this sound doctrine? What is meant by that? Well, it's significant in that it, it reveals to us that even in the earliest years of the church, some 30 years after Christ, that's when this letter was written, about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, there was an established body of doctrine that was recognized as sound and the church could judge all teachings by its standards. So when you listen to the, to the secular historians claim that there was no real doctrine in the church and nobody knew what they believed until the mid-300s with Constantine, that is not true. 
the church had an established body of doctrine. If they did not, how could Paul say, watch out for false teachers and false doctrine? There had to be something to compare it to. So there was an established body of doctrine. The church in the early days was not confused about who Jesus Christ was. They were not confused about who God was. They were not confused about the Scriptures. They were were much more uh, settled on these things than secular historians will often claim. And and the statement here that there is sound doctrine and and Titus is to teach sound doctrine reveals that to us. So so always be careful. Every, Every Easter, every Christmas, the History Channel is bound to flood the, the airwaves um, you know, uh, with their, uh, their garbage and, and their revisionist history of, of Christianity and the Scriptures and Jesus. And, and a lot of that stuff is, is just there for the ratings. It's pseudo-historicism. The Scriptures are very clear that sound doctrine was central to the life of the church in its earliest inception, not 300 years later. You'll notice here, that Titus is not, however, to merely teach sound doctrine. Obviously, that's an obvious, that's, that's a given. But notice here, it says he is to teach that which accords with sound doctrine. In other words, what is in line with sound doctrine? What is in line with sound doctrine? But Paul points out that <clears throat> there is an expectation that godly living will follow sound doctrine. So there is no place in the Bible for a theologian who is not holy. For a student of the Scriptures who is not changed. For a disciple of Jesus who doesn't look like Jesus. There's no place in the Scriptures for this. Just as there is, where there is false teaching, there will be spiritual decay and corruption. Where there is good teaching, in fact the word here, sound doctrine, the word sound is from the, a Greek word from which we get the word hygiene. Good, healthy, that which promotes growth. So the, uh, the, 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 just the, the very nature of the phrase tells us that doctrine, this kind of doctrine, should produce something, and that should produce health. And what is health? Health is godliness. Health is holiness. Health is wholeness, restoration of the heart and the soul, and its reconciliation with God. In the case of the churches in Crete, there were those who were teaching that one salvation was not a free gift of God's grace. Now, we might think, well, wh- wh- why is that such a crucial and critical uh, imp- matter of importance? Well, think about this for a minute. If, if they were teaching that, that salvation was not a free gift of God's grace to be received through faith alone, but rather it's the product of one's Jewish ethnicity. You had to first become a Jew in order to become a Christian. Because Jesus came from the Jews, you have to kind of get in line with the Jews in order to become a Christian. So you've got to be circumcised before you can actually become a Christian. You have to adhere to the dietary laws in order to become a Christian. They had a, uh, Paul mentions this here in Titus and also in First and Second Timothy, Jewish myths and genealogies. There was a great uh, interest in genealogy because ethnicity played a role in this. I'm, if I'm a Jew by, by Abraham, then, then I, I have some claim on the kingdom. And, and Paul is saying, no, none of this matters. And this claim that somehow your salvation is not a gift of free grace through faith alone, but through your own performance or your ethnicity, we have a word for that. Paul has a word for that, and it is legalism. Legalism. And and legalism, friends, is dangerous because what legalism does is it cuts off the sinner from the only one who can save him. That is the danger of legalism. Legalism is not something to be trifled with. It is deadly. The gospel, friends, is the good news of the person of Jesus who has done everything necessary through his life, his death, and his resurrection to save us from the penalty and the power of sin. Everyone in this room was born in sin, born at enmity with God, born his enemy. And we we demonstrate that by the life we live. Isaiah said, all of us have gone astray. We have gone our own way. God says, go this way. This is what is good for you. This is what is good for your flourishing. And we have said, no, we will go this way. And we have wrecked everything as a result. And therefore, we deserve the judgment of God for our sin. The world is broken and we've broken it. And God in His grace has done for us what we could not do for ourselves, what we would not do for ourselves. What has He done? He sent Jesus to come to this earth to live the perfect life we should have lived, to die on a cross for our sins, for our rebellion, for our wandering, for our straying, for our our perpetration of of, uh, 
and justice against our fellow man. All of these things. God, God has poured that judgment upon, upon Jesus. And, and Jesus has paid the price in full through the blood of His Son on the cross. And then someone comes along and says, that is not enough. You have to add these things to it, whether that is baptism, circumcision, dietary laws, name whatever it is that, that people add to the gospel. Legalism ultimately chokes out the gospel because it leads the sinner to believe that he is accepted before God on the basis of his performance. And friends, it can't be both. It cannot be both. That is where Roman Catholicism gets it wrong. That it is both my faith and my works that save me. Well, well friends, where, where's the cutoff there? How many works do I need? At what point have I reached enough? Can I ever be certain? Can I ever be sure? In other words, it, it, as we often say, are you, are, you, are you saying what I think you're saying? That the, 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 the death of Christ, the death of God's only Son on the cross is not sufficient? I have to add to it? That's exactly what you're saying. And that is neither good nor noble. Mark it down, friends. If, if you hold that any part of your acceptance before God is based on your performance, you will inevitably come to trust your performance over the person of Jesus every time. Legalism necessitates it. Because you'll never know if you've done enough. You'll never know if you're good enough. That's why we often say the gospel is not the message of do, it's the message of done. How is the message of, 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 of do more and do better good news to the person who has a needle hanging out of their arm? How is the message of, of, of do more and do better a message of hope for the person who's struggling in a difficult marriage, in a broken marriage. Furthermore, legalism is insidious within the community of the church. It's not just, a, it's not just destructive to our relationship with God, it's destructive to the relationship between the people who are part of the body of Christ. When your basis for God's approval is your performance, His approval is always going to be elusive. See, that's the thing. God will approve of me if I just do better. Well, you'll never know if you've done good enough. And you're going to seek validation. His approval will always be elusive. And so, so you're going to look for ways to validate yourself and, and, and to know that you're doing okay. And you know the best way you can do that is to look to your left and look to your right. Well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. At least, at least I'm doing better than so-and-so over there. And so we, we fall into the comparison trap. And ironically, you would think that maybe this would lead to greater levels of holiness because we're all trying to be better, but it doesn't. You know what it does? It does one of two things. It either leads to a false pietism. In other words, we become super, super, super good at hiding our sins, or at least thinking we are. Or it leads to what we see here in Crete, an embrace of greasy grace, as it's often been referred to, nominalism, right? antinomianism, that, that you can kind of do whatever you want, there's no real, you know, holiness is, yeah, holiness is a good idea, and, but no one ever defines what that looks like, no one ever understands what that means. Crete had become characterized by this, so Paul instructs Titus to bring the gospel to bear on the churches there and show them what genuine gospel fruit looks like. They've been living after the teachings of these false teachers, and it's produced corruption and every gross sort of sin. Now you need to show them what godly living looks like. So here in the verses that follow, Paul paints a picture of what gospel community looks like as its various members fulfill their God-given roles within the church and within the home. Because remember, they're upsetting entire households. So it wasn't just the church that was affected, it was even the households that, that made up the church that were affected by this. 
Now, what follows here is not an extensive list, right? So, so it's important to understand that. This is not an extensive list of everything that everyone in the church is to do, but rather it, it serves as sort of a blueprint for Titus in writing the ship, as it were, the ship of Crete. It would seem that what Titus is to teach are things that up to this point had not characterized the church there. You can kind of make assumptions that the things he's teaching here are revelatory about the problems that existed in this church. One of the hallmarks of corrupt leaders and teachers in the churches of Crete was their self-centeredness and their self-indulgence, right? They were motivated, we're told, by shameful gain. Whether that was their feeding their own ego or whether that was literal money and possessions. It's probably a combination of both of these things. They usually go together. These teachers seem to have a taste for the finer things of life, as it were. They, they, they didn't see the gospel as something related to sacrifice, but rather the gospel was something related to gain. This was not something they did because they loved the Lord. This is something they were doing. This ministry work was something they were doing because they loved themselves and wanted to feed themselves and, 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 and experience all this self-aggrandizement. You know, the prosperity gospel is nothing new. We see it today televised everywhere, and we tend to think that this is some new development in the church. No, it's been there from the very beginning. And just as we see today, church leaders who are motivated by self-indulgence and a desire for the things of this world, they produce what kind of followers? They produce followers who are self-indulgent and who are captive by worldly desires. And that's what's happening here. Church leaders must model sacrifice. They must model what it looks like to follow Christ, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it's costly, even when it costs my reputation, even when it hurts my pocketbook, whatever the case might be. These teachers had not done that. So Paul here instructs Titus to call these believers here in Crete to to a radical selflessness. And it truly is radical by by the, the world's definition to live this way. This kind of selflessness would have stood out among the decadence of the surrounding culture. If you know anything about Greco-Roman culture, humility was not seen as a virtue. Humility was seen as weakness, right? To be humble was not, like in our culture, we don't even realize how much we've been influenced by Judeo-Christian teaching, right? We see humility as a virtue. Throughout human history, that was not always the case, and that was not typically the case, So even our our virtues have been so heavily influenced by Christian teaching that we have come to see things as virtues, which in the time of Paul, they would not have been seen as virtue. Selflessness was not seen as a virtue. Humility was not seen as a virtue. And so Paul is calling these people to do something that was counter-cultural. They were not going to get praise necessarily for these things. He instructs Titus first to tell the older men and women that they are not to use their twilight years in pursuit of their own ends. So it's time to come out of retirement, folks. There's no Greek word for retirement, just so you know, nor any Hebrew word for retirement. It doesn't exist. It's a modern invention. has done a great deal to harm this country. I'm going to say it right now. And look, I love pickleball just as much as the next guy. (laughs) The older men and the older women are not to live lives characterized by leisure, luxury, and consumption, but rather spiritual maturity and a seriousness, not a joylessness. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not talking about joylessness, but a seriousness, a sense of gravity particularly when it comes to life and eternity. Think about this, friends. And let's deal with reality here. If you're older, 60s and your 70s, you're standing on the doorstep of eternity. You're about to enter the presence of God. What do you want to be doing when you step across that threshold? What do you want to be giving your life to when you take your last breath? That should... That should weigh on you. 
that should be something that you feel the weight of. And that, that's what Paul wants these older saints to understand. Older men, he says, are not to be given to trivial pursuits, but they should live lives as is fitting for men who are standing on the edge of eternity, who are about to enter into the presence of God. And likewise, older women, he says, you are not to disengage now that the kids are grown and out of the house, but rather you're to use those remaining years to help train up the next generation behind you so that the kingdom work and the kingdom of God might be furthered. Now, we talk about life expectancy. What is older here? What does that mean? Um, some people say, oh, life expectancy was so young or so low back then. People didn't leave, live to be much beyond 35. That's not technically true. Uh, many of the life expectancy numbers of the Greco-Roman world account take into account uh, infant mortality, which was like something like eight out of every ten babies died before they reached the age of three. So you put those numbers in the mix, and that lowers the whole. But the reality was, if you made it past infancy... Right? And you made it past military age because you were highly likely to be killed in war at this time, especially if you were a male. And go, if you make it through those things, there was a, a likelihood that you would probably live well into your 60s, maybe even somewhere in around 70. So in the Greco-Roman world, there would have been 50, 60, 70-year-old people and a fair number of them. Uh, walking around. So, so don't have this idea that, we're, that all of, uh, because of life expectancy numbers, that everybody was dying at 35 years old. That's just not the case. We know here this word, it's only used one other time to describe this word older. It's in the masculine for men and in the feminine for women. It's used one other time, and that's in Luke chapter 1, when Zechariah, uh, the angel Gabriel, appears before Zechariah and tells him he's going to have a baby. And you remember what he says? How can this be since I am an older man? I'm an old man. So we know that this probably, this word is used to describe those who are beyond childbearing years, right? So older people in the sense of probably those who have raised their families, who we would now look at as being retired. So if you're retired here, he's talking to you in our culture. Right? That's the idea here. And so he says here that, that older men and older women are called to give their lives to the kingdom, and the way they do that is by investing in those who are coming up behind them. And, but he continues on here. He, he continues on talking to younger women. He says younger women here are called to, notice, focus their energies not on their own pursuits, but to love their husbands and their children. And then also, the, the, the word there is managing of the household. So they were to be managers of the household. And then he goes on, likewise, young men are to be self-controlled and follow the example of Titus. What was, and he says you're to be in all respects a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. So, so the younger men, of which Titus was one, were to demonstrate this kind of lifestyle. They were, they were to be men who were known for being self-controlled, not chasing after their own pursuits, their own ambitions, their own dreams. Right? Young men. When, it, when a young man who has children, a wife and children, tells me he's bored, I know there's a problem. You should not be bored. If you have a wife and you have children, there's no room for boredom. If you're bored, it's because you're lazy. It's because you're not doing what you should be doing. And, and so often, we run off in all of these pursuits. We, we leave the home and we run off men and chase these pursuits. And, and, and all the while... We're failing to do the very thing that God has called us to do, the, 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 put, to, to live out the gospel and to, to live out the, our faith in the context where He has placed us. Even slaves we see here, we're called to radical selflessness. Now, slavery in this context is not what we know of as New World slavery. It's, it's a different type of servitude. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can actually go on our website, go to the sermon series we did on Ephesians and look up the sermon on chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, and that will give you a, a, a good explanation, which we don't have time to lay out here, on the type of slavery we're talking about, and give some context for these instructions. But the point is this, slavery was still, even in, in, in this time period, was difficult. It, it was the loss of freedom. You didn't have your freedom. You didn't own yourself. And Paul says here, even in that setting, he says, submit yourself. Submit yourself to your masters. Don't try to take advantage of them. Don't act like all the slaves out there. You be different. Demonstrate exemplary character. And friends, living this way, whether an old man, a young man, a young woman, a young man, 
a slave, whatever, whatever category you find yourself in, to live in, in, in that way, that kind of selflessness, that, is, that can only come by way of the gospel. That is a byproduct of the gospel. It, it, and it, it comes only through complete trust that God's design for our lives is good and right. And a lot of us doubt that. That the place where God has me is the place I need to be. It's the place where He's called me and placed me, and this is where I need to, to, to give my life. That, to recognize that my station in life is not an accident. To understand that aging is not a burden, but an opportunity. To understand that the domestic roles of men and women in the home are not constraining, but rather they are part of the kingdom work God has called us to. Even the household slave we see here has an eternal purpose in his work. I mean, think about how Paul's instructions here contrast with the way we think today. For many, as I said earlier, old age is seen as an opportunity to kind of kick back and relax. You know, finally, I get to do all the things I couldn't do when I was working. But again, retirement is often associated with luxury, leisure, and consumption. But older here suggests an, ex- an opportunity for ministry, not an opportunity for leisure. Titus here is to instruct these older saints that this stage of their life is not to be used to pursue their own self-interest, nor should it be seen as an opportunity to indulge themselves. No, he says the church needs you. There's a generation coming behind you and you need to pour into them. I like how J.I. Packer described old age. J.I. Packer wrote a book some years ago called Finishing Finishing Your Course with Joy. And he wrote it when he was like close to 90. He died a, a few years ago. Great book if you're older. This is what he wrote in that book. The Bible's view is that aging under God and by grace will bring wisdom that is, an, that is an enlarged capacity for discerning, choosing, and encouraging. I love that phrase, enlarged capacity. That is something that comes with age. You, you can't get that from school. You can't get that from a book. You can't get that from YouTube. You cannot get that only by experience. How many of you here now, and you can show a hands, how many of you here who are over 60 would say this, I wish I knew what I know now when I was 20 years old? Oh, <laughs> right? That's obvious. Now, I'm, I'm, I'll be 52 in a few weeks. And I, I think that. So I'm, only, I'm assuming I'm going to continue learning every decade that God gives me, if He so chooses, so I'm, I, that's only going to be reinforced, right? I'm probably going to look back at 52 and think, man, I wish I knew, now, knew at 52 what I know now when I'm 75 if the Lord gives me that many years. Friends, think about it for a minute. That knowledge, and, and you responded overwhelmingly, right? That knowledge and that experience is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. It is a stewardship He has given you. All, a lot of these young people in the room, they, they don't understand that. They don't get that. Right? It doesn't, that, what, that doesn't resonate with them. Maybe on a minute scale, but nothing like what you are experiencing. If you know the Lord, you can look back on your life and you can discern. You can look at your life and your experiences through the lens of God's Word. And friends, when you can do that, you have a gift that is worth more than gold. More than gold. Older saints have a perspective on life that young people need. Remember all those things that once seemed so important to you in your youth that turned out to not really be all that important after all? And all those things that you were willing to let slide that now you look back and like, oh man. I wish, I wish I'd poured my life into that instead. I wish I'd given more time to that instead. Older saints have a perspective. They've likely buried their parents and perhaps buried a spouse 
They probably walk the gamut. Dating, marriage, children, empty nest, retirement, death of a spouse, widowed. Friends, do you know how much experience, if, if that person is paying attention, if they are seeking the Lord in Scripture, they are following His Word, that is a wealth of resource to the church. They've experienced the pain of a wayward child. They know what it is to struggle with failing health. They understand the emptiness of making their career their identity. Conversely, however, they, they also have seen the faithfulness of God in their lives. They, they have seen Him work through tragedy and suffering to bring beauty from ashes. They, they are able to look back and, and say with the hymn writer, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him, or and or and or and or. This experience and wisdom can bring much needed balance to the young people of the church who feel the weight of the daily grind of living. When this church started, you notice up here on the screens, <clears throat> we're 20 years old uh, in a little over two weeks. And back in the early days, if you were 40, you were part of the seniors ministry here. That's how young we were. Right? We were all young and we were all dumb. Right? We did not know what we did not know. I can say that looking back. And I remember people coming, oh, this is such an amazing church. Look at all the young people. And I was like, yeah, that's great, but we could use some age here. Right? We, we're lacking. This is not the kind of place you want to be long term. You want to be in a place where there's age and wisdom as well. There needs to be a good balance of those two things. What better gift, older folks, can you give to the next generation of saints? What better act of worship can you give to the Lord than to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, pouring yourself out for the cause of the kingdom in those years that God has given you at the close of your life, to serve Him right up until the end, to lay down and die and open your eyes in heaven and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So what does this look like, practically speaking? Well, Paul tells us, he says, first thing you need to do is make sure your life demonstrates this kind of wisdom, right? Age, is not, age does not equal wisdom, right? We all know older people that we would probably never take counsel from, right? Because you listen to them for 10 minutes and you're like, yeah, I don't think this person knows what you're talking about, right? Even young people can discern that. So age does not equal wisdom, right? What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge applied. In the case of the Christian, wisdom is God's word rightly applied, God's truth rightly applied. So if you have a pattern of that, if you've done that throughout your life, then, then you are a candidate for this type of ministry. If you've not, it's never too late. Give yourself over to the study of God's word. Seek out saints who can come around you and encourage you and help you not only to learn His Word, but to examine even the course of your own life through the lens of God's Word so that you might then rightly give counsel and wisdom to the younger who need it. Older men and women are to live in such a way that their lives commend the Gospel. They're to be, notice, sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. It's interesting, those, those characteristics are very similar to the qualifications for elder back in the early part of the chapter. Why is that? Because church leaders are not just those who hold office, right? We are all leading someone, ultimately, by example. I, I, I was greatly impacted as a young person growing up by looking and watching the lives of the older people in the church, sometimes for bad, sometimes for good. For older saints, their character should bring stability to the body of Christ because they have walked with the Lord longer. Their lives should provide a portrait of a mature saint for a young believer. So as some of you know, I'm, I'm on the board of, of Legacy Academy, and one of the things that we would love to do at some point is create a portrait of a student. 
when we add the high school and all of that. So there's a classical school upstate that does this. They have a portrait of a student. In other words, and this, it's a beautiful thing to be able to look to because you could say, if you put your child in this school, this is the product of what you should see 12 years later, right? Portrait of a student. Older folks, you should be the portrait of a good saint. You, you should be the type of person that young people can look to and say, I want to be there when I'm that age. How, and then they should be coming to you. How do I get there? Brother, sister, show me. How do I get there? That's what Paul is, is saying. That's what he's calling for. As we often say, more is caught than taught. So think about how much of what you do is based upon what you saw your parents do. Your expectations about what it means to be a husband, a wife, a parent was likely shaped in large part from the example of your parents, even if it's mostly just subconsciously. And the same is true in many respects within the church. The older saints around us set the bar for what the younger saints believe spiritual maturity in the Christian life looks like. So older saints, are you satisfied with where you are currently? If all these young families right now that's sitting all around you lived and followed your example, would you be cool with that? Can you say to them, follow me as I follow Christ? And if the answer is no, then I would ask you to search your soul, to go to God's Word, to seek godly counsel. And to leverage these years of your life. In verses 4 to 8, Paul gives specific instructions as to what is to be taught to the younger saints. The younger women, he says, are to be instructed to love their husbands and children's, children and to direct their energy toward the household. Now this phrase here, working at home, it's a single Greek word. And it literally has the idea of, it doesn't mean homemaker in the sense of the 1950s idea of homemaking that we often have. But it's very much in line with what we see in Proverbs 31. She's a manager of the household. Everything related to the household, she oversees and manages. That's the idea. Now, again, we must be careful not to impose our modern understanding of the household onto the one of Paul's day, right? So during that time, dad didn't typically leave the home to go to work, right? The line between what constituted work of the household and the work of the father's vocation would have actually overlapped significantly. So it was typical that everyone would have, have been home in this time. Not all cases, but in large part, right? The father perhaps working in a blacksmith shop that was attached to the house or, or farming in a field that was attached to the family property or something along those lines. He might have even been a slave. The whole family might have been a slave in the household of the master and they all work together in the care of the of the household, the master's household. So it's not quite what we understand it to be. In fact, I'll, I'll make a little plug for a great book. I'd encourage you all to read it. Uh, Nancy Piercy wrote a book about a year or two ago called The Toxic War on Masculinity. And if you want to see how we have been shaped by the impacts of the Industrial Revolution, which has removed fathers out of the home to go to work and left kids at home with the mom and created this kind of scenario that we think of as normal. It's the water we swim in, but it wasn't that way up until probably the past 150, 200 years. It's a very interesting book, and I highly recommend it. I think it's very insightful. She even talks about the, 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 the trend of remote work now and how it's starting to shift this, this idea and mindset of what the home looks like, that it doesn't have to be what we've thought it had to be for the past 100, 150 years. But anyway, very interesting stuff to think about, and I think it's helpful for couples to, to read and contemplate. But here... The father may have left the home, perhaps. Maybe he was a fisherman who went down to the docks or something like that, or maybe he traveled for trade. But even, even in this, his energy would have been directed toward the home. He wasn't like climbing the corporate ladder. Everything was directed back towards the home, right? To the domestic life of the family. In fact, the instructions given to men and women would have had, again, both, for both of them, would have had the domestic realm as their focus. The man and the woman were to direct their attention back there. Paul wanted, to, wanted the Cretan believers to understand that the Christian home was to be a place of unity and love. And if this was to be the case, then the young women must fulfill their God-given responsibilities to love and submit to their own husbands and be faithful and diligent in the management of the household. And the young men must exercise self-control, which 
Again, a lack of self-control on the part of a young man. The assumption here is that these were probably the husbands. A lack of self-control on the part of a young man is disastrous for the home. So young men must be self-controlled. Be diligent in their work. Fulfill their responsibilities to their families. Just as young wives and mothers would be tempted to find their fulfillment outside the domestic realm, so too young men would be tempted to live undomesticated lives characterized by every sort of worldly pursuit. You know, and we're seeing a a rise in this. It's a reaction against modern feminism. But young men today especially are are more and more prone to confuse uh, masculinity with bravado and, and impulsiveness. But Paul points out that that is not the case. The young men are not to be like unbridled horses, uh, all ambition and no restraint. No, they are rather to demonstrate self-controlled. Fathers, that's the best thing you can teach your sons is self-control. Teach them to harness the energy. That, that it's a God-given energy to produce and to do good things in the direction of a wife and children ultimately. God has given them that. Harness that. Model that for them. Best thing you can do for them. We don't necessarily want to break the will of our children, as some psychologists have said in the past. We want to harness it for the glory of God and for the work of His kingdom. We want to help them direct their energy. So the young men are not to be all ambition and no restraint, but rather they're to demonstrate self-control. Titus himself, a young man, is called to, notice, in all respects be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. Back probably 20 years ago, there was a book on the market that came out called Wild at Heart. Took the church by storm. Lots of men grabbed onto this book and saw it as the new vision for masculinity. It was written by a man named John Eldridge. And the premise of his book is that men men were by nature undomesticated. And the best thing we could do is run off into the woods and find ourselves and conquer and, 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 and do manly things, grow beards and wear flannel shirts, right? Start campfires, all of that stuff. Interestingly enough, a few years ago, Richard Phillips wrote a book by the name of the, called The Masculine Mandate, which many of you have and we've read in men's groups here. And he points out, he says, that does not seem to line up with Scripture. If God wanted man to be undomesticated, why did he put him in a garden? Why did he put him in a garden with a wife? It seems that maybe God did want him to be domesticated. And that maybe he was to, to, to all of that pent-up energy that John Eldridge says, go into the woods and let out, maybe he should have been directing it to his wife and his children. To make sure that they are flourishing, to make sure that they are growing, and that they are healthy. <clears throat> Paul instructs Titus to enlist the older men and the older women in this task. It's not just the elders that are supposed to be doing this. If you're older, you have a responsibility. Older saints, the young people need you. Older men, remember what it felt like when you were a young husband and father? Remember what it felt like to be afraid you're going to drop that baby on the floor when you first held it? Remember, remember what it felt like to not be sure that your job was secure, that you were going to be able to make ends meet? Remember the tension you felt between you and your wife when just life was crazy and you felt distant from one another? You know what? There are young men in this church, all over this church, who feel that way right now. And they need your help. They need help in learning what it means to live, to be godly young men, to love their wives and to love their children. How about you older women? Do you remember what it felt like when you were a young wife and mother? Remember coming to church with your hair all in disarray because you could barely get the kids out the door? Remember the stresses of, am I screwing this kid up? Am I a good mother? Am I a bad mother? I feel like I'm failing my husband. Or me and my husband are always in conflict. Remember all those things that you experienced back in the day? Look around. All these young women in in this room are experiencing the same struggles and the same tensions. And they need you. Maybe you're not sure what to do. As I said earlier, the first thing you do is make sure you're seeking the Lord yourself. That you are in His Word and daily submitting to Him. Because, Because young people, friends, don't need our unfiltered opinions and experiences. They need God's Word. Your opinions and your experiences can be invaluable, but only if they are filtered through the lens of God's Word. So start there. 
In closing, and I want to wrap up here, I want to point out something that Paul makes reference to three times in this passage, I think, passage that I think is important. He gives three motivations. It's the same motivation, but he said it in three different ways for godly living. Verse 5, he tells the young women are to live this way. Notice, that the word of God may not be reviled or blasphemed. Verse 8, he says young men are to, to live this way, so, and, and, and Titus himself as well, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Verse 10, slaves, live this way so that in everything you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. See the pattern? Godly living, gospel living, speaks, communicates truth, reveals something to a watching world. You know, friends, it's one thing to share the message of the gospel. It's quite another to live a life that commends that message. You can say all you want about heaven, about Jesus, about eternity, but if your neighbor sees you living just like he lives, pursuing all the same things he's pursuing, your message has become invalidated. He's just going to look at you and say, you're just like me. You're chasing all the same stuff I'm chasing. Wives, you want to talk about submission to the Lord and living a godly lifestyle. Are you submitting to your husband as unto the Lord as the Scriptures call? Husbands, you rip and rare and complain about leadership in the country and how terrible it is. How are you doing at home? It's a lot easier to complain about who's in the White House than it is to actually get your own house in order. That's what God is calling us to here. Conversations, friends, about the gospel that are not backed up by a life surrendered to God give the world reason to blaspheme the Savior. And I think we see that all around us, right? Any well-known Christian who slips, who falls, who sins, becomes a public spectacle and an opportunity for people to bring reproach on the church and on the name of Christ. And that happens not just in the big celebrity circles, it happens in the day-to-day in the office. There are those moments sometimes where someone will say to me, oh, you know so-and-so? Does so-and-so go to your church? And I'm always like, oh, dear Lord, please let it be a good thing they say. <laughs> but you want people to say that to you. You want, some, you want to work with people who, who, look at, who, who look at you and watch your life and then can say to someone that they meet on the street, oh, I know so-and-so. Wow, they are, there's something different about them. I, I don't know what it is, but it, it, I think it's something to do with God and the Bible because they always talk about Him. They might not be able to articulate what it is, but they recognize that there is something different. And that's the impact that Paul desires the church at Crete to have on Crete. But that can only happen when the amount of Crete in the church drops precipitously. You see, that's the problem. The problem in the church at Crete was too much Crete. That needs to be removed and replaced with the gospel and the power of the gospel. As we come this morning around the table, we are reminded of the power of the gospel. That the gospel is not just a set of propositional truths that you you choose to believe and then live your life by this series of rules. You know, it's not like the world says you get religion. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and took the penalty for our sin, when He was buried and rose again, His work was a work of transformation. And all those who come in faith, trusting in what He, do, what he has done, experience the power of that work. His death becomes our death. Or His life becomes our life. His death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. The new life that He now lives is the life that He gives to us. So that we can live in obedience to all that He has said. Something we could not do before Christ. As we've said so many times, before Christ we had two, two options. We could, do good, we could do good, bad, and bad, bad. We could do good things with a bad motive, and we could do bad things with a bad motive. Since Christ 
has come and the Spirit indwells our hearts, we can now do good, good. We can now do good things with good motives. We can truly and honestly please the Lord in the way in which we live. And that is solely due to the work that Christ has done on our behalf through the cross and the empty tomb and His sinless life. And we have to be reminded of that often. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat and drink, do this in remembrance of me. Remember, 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 because we're prone to forget. We'll see next week. It, it, it is this message, it is the gospel that is ultimately the motivation for everything that we've heard this morning. If, you, if, if you're an older person here this morning and you're going to go out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go help these young people, and you're doing it for some other motivation other than gospel motivation, sit it out. Sit it out. The gospel must be the means by which our lives are motivated. Nothing else. Not a desire to feel good about ourselves. Not because we feel guilty. No, it should be in response to the mercies of God, as Paul said in Romans 12. In view of His mercies, in view of all that He has done, this table, in view of His mercies, the blood and the body, offer your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Thank you.